the focus chart and sound section give the projectionist an opportunity to adjust the sound level and focus the lens before the start of the picture. In a moment, the focus chart and music will end, followed by five seconds of darkened screen before the actual picture begins. Lutheran Church. These are people of the church, people who knew years of persecution, saw half a hundred other Protestant churches destroyed, and over a hundred Protestants murdered. And yet these people have the faith to pray and plan and build, courage to keep the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Columbia not only alive but growing. The spirit to meet the challenge and to fight the good fight of the faith for Jesus Christ. This is their story. And this is the scene of the story. The Republic named for Christopher Columbus, who discovered its shores on his last voyage in 1502. In size, it is almost as large as Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma combined. Here, clustered thickly in the valleys and plateaus, widespread in the steep mountains and dense jungles, live 14 million people. What are these people like? A drive along a street in Bogota, the capital, gives you an idea of the types you'll meet in Colombia. Of an average hundred persons, 20 are white, many of them of pure Spanish blood, imbued with the characteristics of the ruling class of Spain. Seven of the hundred are Indians, five are Negroes, the remaining 68 are mestizos, a mixture of races. Most speak Spanish. In religion, most are Roman Catholics, at least in name, although only about 25% are active in the practice of that religion. About 1% are Protestant. What do they do for a living? That depends on where you are. Here in Bogota, you'll find business and industry much like that of any metropolitan city in the world. Modern architecture, busy streets, large office buildings. From these offices, much of Colombia's exports and imports are directed, for there is a vast amount of trade with the United States, Canada, and Europe. Oil is an important part of this traffic. About 40 million barrels a year are produced, principally by American interests, and 85% of this is exported. Steel is also rapidly becoming an important industry in Colombia. This is one of the largest steel mills in South America. It has a unique supply of raw materials with lime, coke, and ore all found within 20 miles of the plant. Inadequate transportation has hindered the development of other natural resources within the country. Colombia's most profitable and abundant product is its coffee. On high mountain slopes, sometimes more than a mile above sea level, are the coffee plantations, second only to Brazil's in size, the world's leading producers of mild coffee. 300,000 tons are produced in an average year. Three-fourths of it goes to the United States. The fruit looks like cherries, but inside each berry are two seeds the coffee beans. After the pulp has been removed and the beans have been dried, roasted, blended and ground, you may meet these friends from Colombia at a coffee break. Other friends you'd enjoy meeting are Colombia's cowboys, 
for the Republic has a large stock raising industry in the valleys and plateaus. And these sites are as common as they were in our own Old West. In the high hilly country, you'll find the small farmers working their land by hand in the age-old ways. Living on the ragged edge of poverty, and yet fiercely independent in the way of most Colombians. And here and there you may find a more prosperous rancho with some fairly modern farm machinery in operation and many hands helping with the harvest. Or you may come upon another rancher whose blooded cattle would be the pride of any farmer in the world. In the city, you may see people from smaller towns moving their products. Perhaps a man whose only possessions are a wagon, a mule, and the load of baskets he is taking to the market. A market where there are already many more baskets than buyers. But it doesn't matter. There are many things to see while he waits for a sale. A nun doing her shopping. A place where any man with a few centavos can have a meal. And maybe, most fascinating of all, a shop where you can have a new suit made. From yarn to finished product, practically while you wait. Well, you wouldn't call it a suit, but for the average man of the Columbia backlands, what is being created here is a very satisfactory substitute. For this hand-woven wool will become a ruana, or poncho, one of the most practical garments to the Colombian mind ever invented. And now we're ready to see how it fits. Ah, perfecto! What could be better? Let it hang down in front when it rains. Toss it back in a dashing way when the weather's fair. With this, a man can be happy the year around. And of course, there is happiness here in Colombia. For the children, there is a game called Bad Wolf, in which an outsider tries to break into the dancing circle. For those a little older, there is the world's favorite outdoor sport, fishing. Always fun, whether you do it with a rod and reel or with a net. In this region, it is a dietary necessity to have fish for the table. And after the fishing's over, then's the time for a little friendly horseplay. And this is the net result. When the fishermen have gone away, a fellow can have another kind of fun in the river. At the old swimming hole, much like those popular with kids the world around. One game that is truly Colombian has the name of Tejo. It was played here before the Spaniards came. On a Sunday afternoon, the men will gather near the town square, choose sides for Tejo, and enjoy a bottle of beer. Nothing happens as the first stone lands. But somewhere near that target is a charge of explosive, and sooner or later, a stone will strike it in just the right way. Now comes another toss, and this time there is an explosion that's as good as a ringer to a horseshoe player. When in Bogota, the sports fan heads for one of the popular sites of the city, La Plaza de los Toros, the bull ring. Matadors and bulls are sometimes brought in from Spain for the great sports spectacle. From December to February, the bullfight season. Thousands gather here to watch the formalized cruelty that began in ancient Greece and has long been popular in Colombia. First comes the colorful entrance of the performers in what has been called the Ballet of Death. The matadors, who will eventually kill the bulls, are flanked by their footmen, or banderilleros, and followed by the picadores, mounted on horseback, armed with lances. Then the opening movements of the macabre ballet. The matador, light and graceful as a dancer, encouraging the beast to charge his swirling cape, letting the sharp horns almost graze him to draw the applause of the crowd, and at the same time, tiring the animal, infuriating him, 
making him less cautious, preparing him for the so-called moment of truth when the sword will be plunged into his heart. Finally, after perhaps 20 minutes of this uneven conflict, the cheers of Ole! Ole! turn into rousing applause for the victim. Steps of grace have still the hoofs of fight. Scenes of other and more important battles have taken place in Colombia. The old fort at Cartagena on the Caribbean coast was a Spanish fortress used to guard the wealth of a new land against pirates and invaders. The history of South America was shaped by the Battle of Boyacá. It was fought in 1819 near the city of Tunja. Soldiers of Simón Bolívar met the Spanish forces here in one final bloody battle. The freedom and independence of five nations was secured for Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Another strong force in Colombian life, one that has been in the land since the days of the Spanish conquest, is in evidence across the country's skyline. These are the magnificent cathedrals of the Roman Catholic Church, a church that had not felt the impact of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. It claims 95% of the people as nominal members. Powerful politically as well as in a religious sense, Roman Catholicism gained a hold here which has tightened through the centuries and has created a religious climate unlike that of North America, whose colonizers brought with them in the open Bible the cleansing fires of the Reformation and a personal faith in the risen Christ. There is no denying Catholic power in Colombia, power in numbers, in churches, in political influence. As always with Catholicism, pageantry plays a strong part. There are frequent public processions, the largest during Holy Week, which comes to a climax on Good Friday, with very little emphasis being placed on Easter Sunday and the Resurrection. The Virgin Mary, not the risen Christ, stands at the center of worship. This church, with its numerical superiority, and through its influence and control in government, exploited Colombia's political disturbances between 1948 and 1958, a time of religious persecution that led to the closing of over 200 Protestant schools and the destruction of many Protestant churches, including this Lutheran church at Parpa. But God heard our prayers. The pro-Catholic dictatorship of Colombia was overthrown and our ruined churches began to be rebuilt our closed schools were reopened. At this humble chapel of Papa, high in the mountains and accessible only by mule or on foot, the rebuilding is with stone and cement instead of the adobe used in the old church. And this is a symbol of the way in which all of our churches here have been strengthened by their test of fire. You can read the same strength in the faces of the members of this little congregation and their leader, Jose Ayala. These are men and women whose faith has only been made greater by their years of persecution. People determined to worship God in their own true way, regardless of opposition. People whose story of rebuilding and renewal has been repeated over and over in other Lutheran congregations throughout Colombia. There is, for example, the town of El Cocuy, nearly two miles high in the Andes where the greater part of the congregation is scattered through the surrounding mountains, accessible only by Kokui's favorite means of travel, the horse or mule. Here, Pastor Oliverio Mora is packing for a long trip into the high country, to the north and east. And now he's on his way, carrying the word into the highlands, riding as far as the trail allows, then dismounting to walk. On the rooftop of the Andes, there are little isolated farms and people who may not see a stranger for months. And Pastor Mora is not a stranger here. His frequent calls have made him a welcome friend. It is through such evangelists as Oliverio Mora 
that these people learn that ours is not a faith that exists only behind the cold facade of a cathedral, but a living, working religion that reaches out to all the world in the way Jesus went out to the people in the fields and hills around the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes he is invited to share a meal at a farmer's home and to lead in a prayer of thanksgiving for food and the blessing of Christian fellowship. Later he may leave his mount again and go on foot with a fellow Christian to carry the message of Christ's redemption to a still more isolated farm, a little cluster of thatched roof houses in a high mountain valley. Pastor Mora receives a warm greeting, a welcome that becomes all the heartier when he tells of his mission and his work of spreading the good news of a God of love, not fear. Back home in El Kukui, he finds time for a meeting with the board of deacons of his local church to discuss plans for a program of evangelism that will reach even more people of these mountains. Later, he goes to the Lutheran cemetery with his brother to put flowers on the grave of another brother, a Christian martyr who was killed in the wave of Protestant persecution. Although the persecutions and murders have subsided, Oppression continues. Cemeteries are provided by the municipality, but are generally administered by the Roman Catholic Church. Access to them involves red tape and often denial of use. A similar Catholic influence on law affects our schools, such as in the city of Sogamoso. Schools can be controlled by the local parish priest. This one operates only because the mayor appealed directly to the Ministry of Education. This school was erected and dedicated in 1957 to meet the desperate need for education in this area. Of Colombian children between ages 7 and 14, less than half go to school at all. And 50 out of 100 adults are illiterate. In public schools, teachers are poorly paid and often ill-prepared. Furthermore, Protestants are sometimes refused admittance to state or national schools. These children of families in a widespread area show proper loyalty to the flag of their republic and at this school receive a thorough Christ-centered education. An excellent staff of teachers gives these eager children a complete elementary education in all subjects. Not only the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but that vital fourth R that brings all human knowledge into focus, religion. For here, God and Christ are not kept separate from academic subjects, but blended into them in the way faith should be interwoven with every aspect of our daily lives. In the center of this group, at a faculty meeting, is Gustavo Rodriguez, a Colombian Lutheran, who was refused higher education in his own country because of his faith. He went to the University of Minnesota instead, and now is educational director of the Columbia Synod. Here he is talking with Mr. and Mrs. Jose Arisa. Mr. Arisa is dean of the school and a veteran of the Korean War. Each day before classes begin, all of the pupils meet in the school's chapel for the morning devotional service. Teachers alternate with Pastor Gerardo Wilches, in conducting this worship period. The faces of these children are of particular interest, for Sogamoso was a center of ancient Chipcha culture before the Spaniards came, and the ancestors of some of these youngsters worshiped the Chipcha, God of the Sun. Now they worship the Son of God. Like children at any boarding school, they are eager to get their letters from home. Pastor Wilches handles the mail distribution. Pastor Wilches is also active in the outreach activities of the church. He greets one of the cowboys in the great cattle raising district of Casanare, east of Sogamosa. Also active in this large area are dedicated evangelists like Ariel Bello, who spends much of his time traveling from ranch to ranch. Because of distance, it is only on rare occasions that these Christians can come to a church. So he brings the word of God to them, staying with each family for a few days 
then moving on to another. Evangelist Bello is a graduate of our Bible school in the city of Bogota, one of a number of Christian Colombians who are carrying on similar work in many parts of the Republic. Occasionally, when ranches are only hours apart by horse, these men are able to get together a congregation for a Sunday service, held amidst tropical surroundings and attended by people who don't have any Sunday suits, but nevertheless as devout and earnest as any city congregation. Another area where much work is yet to be done is around the quaint little town of Chiscas, surrounded by scenic mountains and inhabited long before the Spanish conquest by Indian tribes. Here we have a chapel, a school, and a loyal congregation, drawn from a few of the townsfolk and from among the farmers. On market day, when many people are in town, our evangelists find great opportunities to tell people about the Son of God. Here, Pastor Mora is greeting a farmer. The man on the right, a Christian builder from the city of Tunja, who has done an excellent and devoted work for the Lutheran Church in Colombia. And these are some of the growing nuclei of believers here in Chiscas. Certainly a wide range of types and ages but nevertheless alike in one respect, for they have found Christ through the evangelism of our church. Quite different are the surroundings in the city of Tunja. This is the capital of the Colombian state of Boyacá. Lutheran work has progressed wonderfully in this area, and a formal congregation was organized here in 1958. Pastor Olger Kwanrud has seen good and bad days in over 20 years of missionary work. He is one of many who have labored in Tunja. Here, Pastor Kwanrud is preparing a young couple for confirmation through private instruction in his home. Soon, they will be members of the church. La Dorada on the famous Magdalena River is also a scene of the work of the Lutheran Church. A new railroad now parallels this river to ensure year-round transportation. Boats, both small and large, are constantly coursing up and down this stream. And the home port for most of them is the city of La Dorada, an important industrial and commercial center of about 35,000 people, surrounded by a rich area of farms and ranches. Our work in La Dorada began in 1958, and we now have a good-sized chapel here. The sermons are, of course, in Spanish, but the sincerity and expressiveness of the pastor make it possible to understand most of the thought, even for those who do not speak the language. Versículo primero del capítulo cinco. Esta lectura hace poco la tuvimos. Así entonces, amados hermanos. There is much Christian work to be done too outside the church although this is not an easy town in which to carry on evangelism and progress has been slow. Here we see the pastor and his wife calling on a shopkeeper whose name is Barbara and who has become a fine leader among the local Christians. Again we see Barbara at a women's Bible class in the La Dorada Chapel. This class which meets weekly is very important in imparting instruction in the Word of God so that these people may grow in their understanding and knowledge. The message of the Reformation has a wonderful newness to people who have spent most of their lives in an atmosphere where religion means prayers to the saints. At Bogota, similar work is carried on on a larger scale at our Bible school. Many young men and women come here to study. The Dean of Women is inviting us in for a visit. And in the classroom, we again meet Gustavo Rodriguez, our educational director, who also teaches here at the Bible School. We think you cannot fail to be impressed by the keenness and sincerity of the young people in this class. These are young men and women who have seen others persecuted and abused because of their faith, but nevertheless value true Christianity so highly 
that they are willing to devote their lives to it regardless of all hazards. Daily devotions are of course a part of the program here at the Bible School and young people worship together in a responsive reading. Students take turns in leading. The chapel service also incorporates frequent use of the flannel graph method. Young people not only learn from this, they also get training in using this method of teaching in classes they themselves will conduct in the future. Aquí está otra campana. Y esta campana es una persona que no tiene lengua para hablar y testificar de nosotros. And here is more practical experience. These young ladies are helping to prepare materials that will be used in vacation Bible schools in smaller cities and towns of Colombia. Students also put together packets of these materials and operate the mimeograph on which the lessons are printed. A Christian couple lend their talents and press to the urgent task of printing Christian literature. Commercial publishing houses are used for larger projects, such as the printing of the Lutheran hymnal, Luther's works, and Lenski's commentary. Among the large churches of Bogota is Our Redeemer's Lutheran Church. The church serves both Colombians and foreign-speaking Lutherans, for there are many Europeans in South America. Services at the meetings for Colombians are, of course, conducted in Spanish, although the forms are the same as those used in Lutheran churches throughout the world. The pastor is Pausanias Wilches, and the congregation which was organized in 1953 includes men and women of various social levels. In its evangelistic work, this church also reaches out to other preaching places in the city and conducts the regular activities of a big city Lutheran church anywhere in the world. There are baptisms into the Lutheran faith, a brave step in a country where becoming a Protestant once meant being virtually ostracized. There are weddings whose solemn rites are unmarred by the fact that Protestant nuptials are still not recognized by the government and must be preceded by a civil ceremony. But important as these ceremonies are, Another of even greater significance occurred here in Bogota a few years ago. In July 1958, Colombia's own Evangelical Lutheran Church came into being. Several of the delegates present report concerning this great and historic event. I hold in my hand an important document. The Constitution of the Evangelical Lutheran Church Synod of Colombia. This document signifies the transition between mission and an indigenous church in Colombia. After Pastor Mork spoke, Gustavo Rodriguez, secretary of the newly formed synod, introduced Pastor Gerardo Wilches. Las iglesias con las cuales trabajo expresan su gratitud y alabanza a Dios. The churches I serve are grateful to God. Al ver realizado su sueño en conocer la Iglesia Colombiana organizada en Sínodo, because they have seen realized their dreams of having the Colombia Church organized as a synod. Then came a few words from Pastor Pausanias Wilches of the Church of Our Redeemer in Bogotá. Para la Iglesia del Redentor ha sido muy significativo el paso que la Iglesia Evangélica Luterana en Colombia. For the Church of the Redeemer, the organization of the Evangelical Lutheran Church has been very significant. Next, Pastor Mora spoke in Spanish, and Mr. Rodriguez again translated. And we have also noticed that it is good to share ideas for the advancement of the work. The Reverend Olger Quanrut was one of the first Lutheran missionaries to come to our beloved country, and he is now serving the congregation Prince of Peace in Tunja, Boyacá. 
This event is a very important one as far as I'm concerned because after 22 years of work here, it shows a tremendous growth in our church in this country. There were greetings from Pastor Julio Orozco, a member of our church who works independently of the Synod. Esta iglesia nuestra se haya constituido como sínodo. It's a blessing for Colombia that this, uh, our Lutheran church, has been organized as a synod. Then a few words from Pastor Harold Olson. I trust that God will use this instrument in his hands to the glory of his name. And finally, a summation of the purpose of the formation of the Colombian Synod from Pastor Arnfeld Mork. I consider my ministry in the congregation of Socata a temporary thing, since it is part of the policy of our Synod to develop as soon as possible an indigenous ministry. God has brought these congregations of ours through times of difficulty and persecution, times in which we have seen their faith tested and in which they have shown themselves as coherent, a church, even before the organization of the Synod. It is our earnest prayer that God may always keep them faithful to Christ, the head of the church. May all of us join in that prayer. May we remember always the courage and self-sacrifice of our fellow Christians here. And may we be as willing as they to fight the good fight for Christ Jesus, to meet every challenge as they met theirs among the people of Colombia.